Hello and welcome to S75. Uh, this is a section, the evening of July the 9th. Uh, we're going to be doing a walkthrough for Project Zero and discussing some issues related to PHP, XML, and XPath. Um, so the spec is up for Project Zero. If you go to s75.net, you can see it's up on the main page. Uh, wait, Let's see, see s75.net. It's on the main page here, Project Zero specification. And um, a few of the instructions that I'm going to be doing tonight will be slightly different than your configuration because I haven't downloaded the latest version of the appliance yet. But I'm sure that we'll have an opportunity to confront some of the differences between what I'm doing and the current version of the appliance in future sections. Um, so first of all, you'll want to create a Bitbucket account. Uh, so in the section labeled Bitbucket, you can see that it asks you to go to bitbucket.org slash plans. And I actually don't have a Bitbucket account, so I'm going to sign up. You want to sign up for the free account. And it says to be sure to use a .edu address so that you're automatically upgraded to an unlimited student plan. Uh, and so I will use my name and click Sign Up. Doesn't look like there's any errors on the page. So um, now I have an unconfirmed email address. So I'll go to my email account and we'll probably have an email from Bitbucket asking me to confirm. There, now I've been confirmed. So if you go back to uh, the Bitbucket instructions, uh, the first new thing is to create a new repository. Create repository. And we want to put project zero under name. And we want a git repository. And then we want both issue tracking and wiki under project management, if we like. Um, I'm actually not going to do that because I'm not going to be using those features. Um, under language, we'll select PHP. And then we'll input a value for the description and the website, if you'd like. Um, I'll put project zero for CS75. So um, we created a repository. Um, and then you should find yourself at a page whose URL uh, includes your username and project zero. Uh, so I actually haven't finished creating this URL. Not going to enter a website because this isn't going to be live on the internet. Um, so here's my username and my project zero. Um, the, ver the first thing you want to do is um, set up SSH. Uh, and so if you go to your SSH directory, um, you can see I already have an ID, .rsa, ID underscore RSA dot pub key. Uh, and that is what you will create uh, by doing SSH key gen. Um, so I already have this RSA pub key. And um, the uh, in order to um, get that pub key, you want to do, you want to use genie. And then you'll go into your Bitbucket account into, uh, and then paste the text, pa paste the key into the field called SSH keys. So 
So in account, SSH keys. Here's my whole SSH key. You want to copy the whole line with no new lines. So don't copy the new line if you can. And um, paste it in. Add key. It looks a lot like GitHub. The, this interface here is probably uh, sub, uh, somehow related to GitHub. Um, so now we want to create our initial commit into the repository. So So this is the part that will be slightly different for me than for people running the appliance. So the equivalent of the vhosts directory for me is the public HTML directory, um, which is the directory where I will store all of my public facing HTML files. Um, if I go into public HTML, um, then I will, uh, let's see if they already had you. Make a directory called public or uh, called project zero. And uh, you can see that it doesn't have the right permissions. I need at least 711 permissions in order to be able to execute code in that directory. Um, and in order to make it uh, a little bit more friendly to view online, I'm going to give it a little bit more generous permissions. Um, so I'm going to chmod 755 project zero. And um, Then um, I have a project zero directory, and this project zero shows up. Um, so uh, now let's go back to the walkthrough. I'm inside of the project zero directory, inside of the directory that will let you show your HTML on your local host browser. Um, and th these commands here are not, um, they're not necessary, th it's not necessary for you to be in this directory, um, at least for the config global. Um, but I will do git init, and it says initialized empty git repository, and then I will say git add hyphen, hyphen, all, and get commit dash m initial commit. OK, so you can see that it says um, one file changed and one insertion and zero deletions. So git is a source code manager. Um, I've talked about git in previous sections. Um, there are some resources about Git in the project uh, in, in the project zero PDF. Um, one of my favorite uh, Git resources uh, for beginners is uh, if you go to um, the S75 sections page uh, where I store my code for on GitHub. Um, 
you'll see down here that um, there are a lot of Git resources. And um, one of my favorite videos is uh, a UE Theater uh, video where it really runs you through the different um, workflows for Git. Um, and in general, uh, I'll just give you the, the feel for it. Um, so um, we'll do So you can see here that the, the project, uh, project zero background is red because I specified this attribute, bg color equals red. Um, and if I, um, let's say I want to work on a new feature, uh, then I can do git branch or um, git checkout b. Let's, let's start working on the new feature called blue. And if I say um, get branch, you can see now that there's a star next to blue indicating that I now have the, the blue branch checked out. Um, and each branch is literally a separate branch in your code that can, sep that can um, uh, separate the different features that you're working on at one time and then later on you can merge them together. So now I can go into the index and change the background color to blue and refresh it here and it'll be blue. And um, uh, if I do git add a, that's a synonym for git add hyphen hyphen all like we did before. It get it's um, if you do git status, um, it shows you that um, the index.php is modified and uh, it's not staged for commit. So right now, uh, since there is nothing in this section of uh, the git status message nothing would actually be committed if I were to make a commit right now. In order to stage that modification, I can do git add a index.php. Now if I do git status, um, you can see um, changes to be committed um, includes the modifications such as making this blue. Um, and uh, then you can uh, do a commit git commit um, finished blue feature. This is my nice uh, commit message. And um, now I'll do git branch and I can see I'm still on the blue branch if I do git checkout master. Now it, it says switch to branch master and you can see the this directory is white, or, or this background is white. And if I do vim index.php, you can see that th those background, uh, that background color is not even present here. Um, but if I do git merge blue, and then refresh the page, now it's blue. So basically what it did is it, it took the code from the blue branch and it merged it in, uh, tracking where all the insertions and deletions were in each of the subfiles. So what this enables you to do um, is uh, uh, work on, keep your master branch clean as of your latest uh, good working version. And then you do git checkout b. No. Uh, dash b, and then feature name. 
and that will switch you to a brand new branch called feature. And then you can continue working on that feature. And then at any time, you can go back to the working version um, and, and get it. Um, and uh, so now let's finish setting up Bitbucket because you'll see the, the true value of Git um, once uh, Bitbucket is, uh, is set up. So we've made an initial commit. I'm going to make this nice and big. And um, you can see this is the command we're going to be working on right here. Um, git remote add origin git at bit bucket dot org. And then you want a colon and then do your username p nori slash project zero dot git. And uh, that should be if you That should be this project. Git, yeah, see, git at bitbucket.org slash pnori slash project zero dot git. And then git push u origin master. Um, the very first time, you'll have to say, yes, I do want to commit, or I do want to acknowledge that that, um, that, that domain is, is trusted. Um, and now, if we visit Our source code will appear here. Oh, yeah, you're right here. So this should be. OK, so now I've messed it up. Um, th the um, so basically your um, your code will appear on Bitbucket after you push. If you don't misspell git get at bitbucket.org. Um, and um, if, as long as you keep doing git commit and then git push, then your, uh, the most recent version of your code will always be stored online. And what that will mean is that at any time you can uh, delete your entire directory and then do git clone and then your Bitbucket URL and you'll be able to download the most recent version of your code from online, which will provide you some insurance in case your, um, your appliance uh, goes corrupt or something. Um, so um, after you have git configured, then you'll want to start thinking about um, how to encode the menu in XML. Um, we've already talked a little bit about um, the uh, about how to do XML in PHP. Um, specifically, in last week's lecture, we talked about how to parse RSS, and uh, David talked a little bit about that in his lecture. Um, and uh, If you were here last week and you saw um, our, the section about um, working with model view controller in PHP, um, we created a, um, a simple model of a blog using an, RSS, um, using an RSS XML as a data storage mechanism. Um, and this is what that blog looked like. Um, and it has 
only one controller element, only one user interface element, which is that you can press next buttons until you get to the end of the posts, and then it grays out. And then you can press previous buttons until it gets to the end of the posts, and then it grays out. And all of the information from each of these blog posts in, and uh, the blog title and the blog subtitle is stored in an XML file. Um, and um, so you can see that the, the context uh, for, for this application divided up model, view, and controller into three separate folders. Uh, you can get a nice directory tree like this in ASCII using the tree command in Linux. Um, Um, which gives you a nice uh, printout. Um, and so in, in MVC, in general, how the, the flow of MVC goes from one file that's the entry point to the controller, the controller pass, makes a request to the model, and the model makes uh, it interacts with the data storage mechanism and then passes the data back to the controller and the controller then um, does any final formatting that's necessary and prepares the data to, um, to be sent off to the appropriate view where the view that the, the user sees is rendered. Um, and in this case, this is the order of execution. Um, and uh, so you can see that there's a, a separation between the controller and the model and the controller and the view and the controller. The controller is kind of the cement that, that binds it all together. Um, so um, if we go into the model uh, data.xml, um, you will have to invent your own XML schema for uh, project zero. Um, I chose my own, uh, I, I, I chose RSS because it's already a well-known uh, XML format for, um, for doing blog things. And um, the, uh, the model in this case uh, parses this, this uh, XML file and uh, and renders each of these blog sections and, uh, and provides the information necessary to gray this out uh, if there are no previous blog posts. Um, if we um, go to So the first point of entry is the controller, which is up top. Um, and the, um, the data structure here, um, I've created an array of like queries, basically, to, to query the model with. And each of these is a variable that I want to be filled in with some kind of data. And, um, when you're using MVC, you want your model to be um, s separate from your controller. And the idea is that a team that's halfway across the country uh, could be working on the model, and they could be coding all of the business logic into the model. And then you could be coding on the controller. And then at the end, you'd be able to hook it up together. So it's important to have an interface uh, that uh, enables you to uh, keep a, s a separation between the model and the controller um, that just helps you write clean code. In this case, um, these variable names are variable names that I know that the model supports. Um, and this is slightly different from the version of the application that I presented last time, where I actually put queries right in the controller. Um, if you look at um, So 
here the controller is 65 lines long, and here it's only 31 lines long. In general, if you find your controller inflating with logic, like notice here I have to do an, an if call, you know, if, if you have lots of uh, logic inside of your controller in order to just render the data necessary uh, that for the view, then in, you might have what's called a fat controller. Um, which is a good sign that you need to move some of that data back to the model. Um, and the model in this application um, uses XPath, um, which is an XML query language, as Deva, David mentioned, um, in order to access each of the variables. So for each of these variables, like um, posts to display, it gets passed into the model, and down here, it, I iterate through each of the queries, and um, if a function exists with the query name, like each one of these is an associative array, we have post number to display goes to, and then a string of length zero, um, if a function exists called post to display, then I use a function call user func uh, to call the function with that name and with the parameters indicated here. In this case, no parameters or default parameters. So for each of these um, queries uh, down here, as long as I create a function with the same name as the query and then return, the value uh, that is supposed to, to enter in here, then after uh, the model is included, then now the data variable will actually include the, uh, this same data array, except the, the data will be filled in by the model. So if I comment out the two lines that were in front of uh, this echo comment, which is going to print recursive the data variable, you can see that um, it's filled in the posts to display variable with the appropriate data. Um, so the way that that has worked um, is that I've stored a query here in posts to display that um, is an XPath query. Here, the query is, um, let me get the data open, app 6 Yeah. Okay. Right yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um. So uh, this particular query is the RSS. Um, it, it seeks the RSS element, and then it seeks the channel element, and then it seeks the item element, and then it applies a filter to that where the position um, XPath method is equal to a digit. Um, and the digit here defaults to one. Um, but um, here I find it really useful to um, look at the um, simple XML or um, to the notes that I've put on XPath in uh, README. So Stylus Studio's XPath reference, um, this, this uh, page here is at the bottom of my S75 sections page. Um, this reference for Stylus Studio is a, is a great reference for the XPath functions that are available to you and to just the general syntax of an XPath query. Um, so um, here they're showing you that like, uh, this uh, query would select the para children that have an attribute of type equal to warning. Um, 
So um, when you're designing your, uh, your XML structure, you want to think about making a structure that's easy to query with the, with the X path that you understand. Um, so uh, let's get out and um, let's look at menu.xml. Um, so this is a simple menu. And um, so the way that you get to the point where you can actually uh, read in the XML and conduct XPath queries on it, uh, you have to uh, use simple XML load file. That's it. Um, let's just do a print R on this to begin with. And um, yeah, simple XML element load file. So uh, this file is in the same directory as menu.xml. So um, let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, it should be the same file, actually. Um, so you can see if I do a print R, it doesn't look very great on the top. So let's um, actually um, echo pre. All right, so um, simple XML lo load file returns a six simple XML element object. And inside that object is um, an array, an associative array, um, where, well, it's iterable, but the, um, the comment property goes to another simple XML object, and the pizza's, prop, uh, pizza's property of the simple XML object goes to another simple XML object. Um, so in order to access, um, let's do, Um, if we if we do XML pizzas item um, and I uh, and we'll um, this one is called um, tomato and cheese. Um, and uh, in simple XML element, or in the simple XML element class, um, it's uh, more tricky to get a hold of the attributes, um, which is why you might want to stay away from them. Um, and instead go um, uh, 
because now we can descend into this uh, element. like that. Um, so here I, I called forth the tomato and cheese element by being able to um, descend into this. Um, and each one of these uh, on the menu, uh, you're going to have to kind of take a look at the menu and figure out how it is that you want to break it up. You only have to do a few from each uh, from each section uh, but um, you want to uh, think about how to uniquely identify each of these um, because somehow you're going to have to pass uh, information about you know, this exact purchase that's going to be uh, passed over to the server. Um, and it needs to be able to, to identify that, that that element is actually the large broccoli pizza. Um, so here we could do um, pizza's um, item name equals Um, and then we could do uh, a price element, or we could do a um, size element. Um, if we do a price element, um, then we're just going to have to do large or small. Um, And you could um, dispense with the price altogether. Let's see, what is the broccoli? 1085. Um, here's another issue. Um, let's uh, parse the, uh, let's say that you have, um, pizza name to get in a variable. We're, we want the broccoli one. Um, then you could do uh, item. Uh, you could execute an XPath query on this with the XPath method. Um, and uh, you could say pizza's item um, name equals And let's see what that gives us. So let's put another one in here just to make sure that we're not getting the wrong one. It's another one. Uh, tomato and cheese. That one's cheaper. Nine seventy five. Okay, we're still getting the correct, assuming that you have the name of the pizza here and you already know that you're getting pizzas, 
we're, we're getting the right pizza element here. Um, and uh, the, uh, let's say that we have um, pizza size in a variable. And um, it contains either the word large or the word small. Then you could do, um, the, uh, let's set, um, we, so now the pizza we want is, uh, is indicated or it get is the uh, the this array or this uh, result right here with a single element um, that is now available inside the pizza we want variable. Um, so if we wanted to get at the um, the pizza size that we did, then we should be able to. Um, do a um, pizza we want. And th this is an array, so we have to do zero. We have to iterate into the array in order to get the first object out. Um, it just so happens that there's only one, one result. You might want to find out how many XPath results there are in which case you'd want to do count of the array. And in this case, it'll do one because um, there's only one result. Um, and if we want to get at the, s let's uh, put the small size in just so that we know we're getting the right one. So for broccoli, it's 685. And we want to get at the pizza size. And it echoes out 1085. Um, so now what if you wanted to get two of these and then I uh, print that out. If I do this, if I get 1085 times 2, I get 20. So there's something funky going on there. And it has to do with the type conversion. When you get things out of um, XML, um, they have to be converted into the form that you want to use it in, in PHP. Um, so let's say that we want to um, uh, store it as a float. Um, Okay, so now we get a better answer. Uh, you can see it's 21.7, um, but floats are approximations, and that's a big problem with money if you're approximating um, with cents. Now, granted, with a pizza restaurant, you're probably not going to get into the quantities where it's really going to matter, uh, but when you're building things for clients, you should assume that <laughs> It's really important for you not to mess with their money. Um, so in this case, it might actually be smart for you to think, think twice about storing this as a float and dealing with it as a float. Um, 
floats are, um, are always approximations. They're always one number divided by another number. And it's the, you, what you're getting is the number that's closest to whatever that is. And if you add enough of them together, eventually you'll get a rounding error. Um, you might uh, get two numbers that add up to 10.99 instead of adding up to 11. Um, so instead, what we could do is store it like this in pennies. Because um, pennies are quantifiable. Um, and then at the point where we actually um, s display it out to the screen, we can still divide it by 100 and still get 21.7. And at this point, you might be wondering, how do you get it to format the right way? Um, and uh, there's a, um, in, in some of the model code for this section, um, app model. So this function, sprintf, is often used to format strings. You can also use number format. Um, and uh, which takes a number um, and then a number of decimals. Um, so let's try that. Okay, so now we need the dollar sign. If you put it in uh, single quotes, the dollar sign will appear as you want. If you put it in double quotes, then you'll kind of confuse PHP a little bit, um, but it'll probably be okay um, because in, when you use double quotes, it interpolates it. Um, so actually here, I shouldn't be using double quotes. I should be using single quotes because um, every time you use double quotes on a string, uh, PHP wastes a few clock cycles trying to see if there is a variable in there that it needs to interpolate. Um, but let's see if this works. Yeah, that works okay. So now you can display the total out to the, stream, out to the screen. But um, if you do all your math in terms of uh, pennies, then you'll never get any rounding errors or anything like that. You might want to uh, use the seal. Um, function in order to um, get to the ceiling if you're rounding things. You might want to get to the floor function if you want to round to the floor. Um, the, in general, you're going to have to, uh, to uh, somehow create, an elem create a way to display the menu um, and uh, then make a way for a user to uh, select an item and pass a unique identifier of that item to the user or to the server. Um, and one way that you can do that um, is uh, by doing, uh, passing each of these parameters as uh, get parameters. So you could do level one equals pizzas, um, and uh, level two, or or you could even uh, since each of these is um, is a separate category, um, you could say instead of calling this pizzas, you just get rid of the item, um, and instead call this pizza. Now you have a really um, really simple categorization. Um, 
uh, where when you're displaying the pizzas menu, uh, you uh, can pass in uh, the menu name and then pass in the, the name of the element you want to select and then the relevant price. Um, and you'll have to keep track using the session uh, variable. Um, you'll have to keep track of what is stored in the user's cart. Um, you can go back to previous section's code. Um, if you want to see a few examples of that. Um, so um, in six, sorry, no. In 627, we talked about session. Um, so uh, in here, um, we, uh, you, you can go through these um, examples in order to see how to use the session um, variable. The basic gist of it is that you, wanna, you need to call session start at the very top of the code. And since you're going to be wanna, you, using templates, um, you'll want to do this in one template and then include that in, in all of the pages that the user sees so that all of the users don't see uh, each other's carts. Um, one uh, little thing to think about is that um, the session, uh, the way the session works is that it's uh, literally a folder on the server that, ha that is named like a long number. And that long number uh, equals a number that is stored on the user's computer in a cookie uh, that is sent along with the request to the server. And um, so if you think about every single user having a different number and a different folder on the browser, then you'll see that you probably don't want to store the menu in the session variable. Because essentially, then what you'll be doing is for user one, two, three, you'll store a menu. And then for user one, two, four, you'll store the, you'll store the same menu. Um, and so there will be a lot of storage duplication if you do that. Um, instead, you should think of a way to generate um, the views from the XML in, in real time um, or, or cache them in some other way. Um, and um, so, so that you, you aren't unnecessarily burdening the server with uh, the, the details of the menu. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to um, show you a few different XPath tools. Um, so if you go to github.com slash codekiln slash s75 hyphen sections, you can um, get all of the code for each of the sections. And then down here under XPath, um, there are a few different tips. Um, here, uh, you can uh, use this add-on called Scraper um, in order to test out XPath. Um, so you, you'd open up Chrome, and uh, you'd say Add to Chrome. And um, then, uh, I have all these. Oh, yeah, I messed with the source. OK. So. Um, what Scraper is good for um, is that if you come to a page like this, which um, has the list of all the postal abbreviations, and let's say you were working on a project where 
you needed a drop-down list that had all of the postal codes in it, and you wanted your users to select the postal codes. Um, then if you have the scraper um, extension installed, you can right-click on an element and say Scrape Similar. And you can see it gives you a good guess, a, a good guess of the XPath that um, lets you scrape um, all of those postal abbreviations. Here you can see kind of what it's doing, Alabama AL, ALA dot, ALA dot 01. It, that's just reading this very first row. Um, but if you press Control Shift C and examine the element, um, you can guess that it's always going to be the second table data element in this table that contains these postal abbreviations. So maybe you could say you want just the second one. And then you realize that it already has a predicate limiting you to the very first table row. So now when you remove that predicate, you get all of the, all of the states. And you can copy from there into a tool like uh, Notepad++. And here, you can use regular expressions um, to uh, clean up the text. If, in, if you select regular expression in Notepad++, um, you're able to use uh, regular expression keywords like um, backslash uh, w is a non-word character. You can see there are a couple of those. And then I could do a digit character followed by a digit character that may or may not be there followed by another non-word character. And if I replace all of those by nothing, now I have all of, my, um, all of my abbreviations and a few extras, um, because it includes like minor uh, outlying islands and stuff like that as well. Um, so at this point, you could paste it into your PHP code and uh, make a select where each of these is an option that you could drop down. Um, Another example of using Scraper, um, you can, uh, if you are on a rating site, and here they make it pretty hard to um, just get a list of all the people. Um, they, they have it here in the page, but if you wanted to actually um, make a list of each of these people, um, you'd have to type it out one by one or copy it out one by one. Um, and if you select here and do scrape similar, it, makes, it gives you a guess. Um, but if you look at the source code, you can see that they've really obfuscated it. They've put tables within tables within tables. Um, and uh, so, if you go down and you notice that the TR here, the table row, has a height of 30, um, then now you could um, search for if you do two forward slashes, that means all elements where this matches. So I'm going to look for the TRs. All of the TRs in the document would return tons and tons of TRs. And you can see some of them are in there. We want a subset of that. We want the TRs where there's an attribute height equal to 30. And now you have the same list. You can copy it and uh, paste it into Notepad++ and clean it up. Here I'll do another regex example. We'll do a non-word character followed by a digit, followed by another possible digit, followed by a non-word character. Let's see how far that gets us. Now we have another digit um, followed by a literal period, followed by another non-word character. And I believe there's another digit. The question mark means zero or one of these. So now we've got that. So now you have your list. Um, if you wanted to 
do a quick blog post about that or whatever, or do a Google search on each of those. Um, so Scraper is a great way to practice your XPath skills. Um, in fact, you can even um, open up you know, the, the XML for your, um, for your menu in your browser. Um, you'll have to make sure that it has the right permissions. Um, so if you do ls-l, you can see it, it is not world readable. Um, so we'll chmod uh, 644-menu.xml. And um, now we'll go back to the sections. And um, menu.xml is here. You can see um, that it doesn't have any style information associated with it. Um, here, uh, if you press Control-Shift-C, um, Oh, this is not the raw X XML by any means. Um, I was thinking that you'd be able to um, actually use XPath right on the thing, but it doesn't look like you'll be able to. But I did want to point out that um, the XPaths that you're able to get in Scraper, um, you are also able to uh, get at using this search elements dialog in Chrome. So if you click here and right click, like let's say we right click on this A element, this anchor element that is for the PHP manual, and you do copy XPath, and then do search elements and paste it in, um, and maybe remove some of the predicates, um, then you can flip through the different matches. Um, here's the introduction match. Um, and it gives you a, a good guess. Here we have um, the, uh, the star operator, which matches any element. And then we're putting a predicate on ID equals left bar. And then whatever element has an ID attribute equal to left bar, we're looking at the, the elements that have a UL child and an LI child, and then finally an A child. Um, so you'll get pretty comfortable with, um, with XPath in this assignment. Um, hopefully you will. Um, if, if you don't do something um, terribly workaroundy, uh, you will. And um, so do you guys have any questions about um, XPath or, um, or XML in PHP? I think we've covered everything that you basically need to know. We're going to be um, online answering questions and stuff as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the question was, um, does the spec include the requirement that you have an ability to see your entire cart before you check out? And I haven't read the latest version of the spec in detail, but I believe it does. Previous years have had that requirement. Um, and so you'll want to make a page that enables you to see the contents of your cart and that enables you to add things to your cart and subtract things from your cart uh, before checking out. That's a good question. Um, and let's just take a look at that file. So that means um, I will be uh, writing uh, the categories in the XML, and uh, PHP will be uh, um, rendering this uh, category So the question um, was, uh, so the general format of the project is to create a categorization of the menu in XML and then to use PHP to pull the information from the XML and then display it out to the page 
and then use PHP's session functionality in order to store the information about the cart uh, that the user is uh, interacting with through separate page requests and then finally providing them with the ability to check out and clear their cart. Is that kind of, you were just trying to clarify the process? Yeah, yeah that's, that's generally it. Uh, can you say the last part? Whatever you selected, what? Let's say I, I decided to create and then I logged out. When I logged in back, should I have to display like, okay, last time you have selected this application? Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, should I make it so that you can select several items and then log out and then log back in and then still have those items selected? And uh, the answer to that is that you don't have any logging in or logging out functionality in this application. If you want to do that, that's above and beyond the spec. Um, the spec is only to implement the cart. Um, so in this case, um, this application is kind of a, a trivial e-commerce site because in a real e-commerce site, we would be gathering credit card information. And you wouldn't want to gather credit card information without confirming a user's email address and stuff like that. Um, and you probably won't want to go that far in this assignment um, because the details of sending mail through a server that's running on your own computer and, and getting it to actually arrive in a real email inbox, that's pretty complicated and that's beyond the scope of this project. Um, it can be done, uh, but it's a more complicated development uh, situation than we really have the time to deal with. Does that... Pretty much, yeah. So um, the uh, there's a there's so much to to work with here. Um, if I was going to sit down tonight uh, with a student at, who didn't know where to start, I would say first develop your menu XML, develop a menu XML. Don't develop the entire menu. Just develop a menu XML that has like. 10 items in it or something. So um, and then render menu. Uh, and then um, render way to select items and then add ability to put in cart um, and then um, from there I would add the ability to check out and what check out means in the case of this assignment is telling the user, you have purchased this amount. It will be billed to your email account or, or to your credit card or whatever. And um, then you should call session destroy. And um, clear the session so that if they go through another purchase, they'll be able to fill up their cart again. Um, and once you get to this point where you're actually able to um, render 10 items and render a way to select them, add an ability to put in the cart, and then check it out and call session destroy, then you can add a few more items for edge cases. And, and you know, so step six would be iterate and inflate the menu and change the rendering for the bugs that you get when you inflate the rendering. Um, and if you can close this circle at least once before you get to the point where you're re trying to render all the different categories and dealing with all the subtle things, um, you won't, uh, you, you will get a lot farther and you will understand the scope of the project before, um, before, because you know, you can get really, 
really involved with the menu if you want to, and it's, it's best not to get hung up at any one of the steps. Um, so it's 7.25. I think that that's probably uh, as much as we have, to have time for tonight. Do, uh, is there any more questions? If not, we can take them offline. Um, so good luck on the project. Get started uh, tonight, tomorrow. Uh, the 18th is just a, a week, a little over a week away. So um, that means that you know, if you can close this loop by Friday and get the questions to us on Saturday, then you can spend the next three days kind of trying to figure out the submission process and trying to figure out the permissions on the server and all of those like kind of tricky things. Um, you should allocate, if, if you've never worked with Linux before, you should probably allocate like at least 15% of all of your time to deployment. If not more, maybe 20 or 25%. The very first time you deploy to the assignments in this class, you'll find that that is really hard. Um, and that is not unlike real life. When you actually deploy a website, it is usually not painless. It's usually a, a tricky process. Um, so in general, with web development projects, you should allocate at least 15% of your time to, to deployment. Um, unless, I mean, unless it's a huge project, in which case 15%, you know, it, it's only going to take a fixed amount of time, probably. So. All right, that's about, that's about everything. Uh, thank you for your attention, and thank you for your patience with our technical uh, difficulties. We'll attempt to get them resolved before next week. Um, thanks so much. <laughs>